All right, we are on. Well, I appreciate Pastor uh, John and Shanti uh, for putting these two sessions together, uh, Freedom and Healing and then Freedom and Finances, because as you know and maybe have experienced in the body of Christ, these are the two major areas that believers struggle in. And um, there are many different reasons for that. Um, but one is, is obviously uh, knowledge that is revealed. You know, you and I, the way we live our Christian lives, it's not just by information, but information that is revealed to us by the Spirit of God. Because that's when faith begins to come alive and begins to work in our lives. Um, as you heard, you know, Brother Eddie mentioned that last night. Um, and so I guess what we kind of have planned for this session is Tadas and I are going to tag team a little bit. And, uh, and, but we want you, what we want you to do is we, we trust by the Spirit of God that we get your questions answered. You know, there's so many questions that are centered around finances and also healing in the, in the, in the body of Christ. And there are different reasons. And, I, and, I, and I'll just say this is the reason because we have, a, not only do we have a spiritual life, we have a natural life. And I think sometimes when it comes to a spirit-filled people, you know, we just, all we do is just focus on the spiritual and not realize we do live in this physical world and that there are some natural things that you and I are required to do by the word of God. You know, just we, what we say is just some good common sense things, you know. And um, like, for example, when it comes to healing, I know, I know for myself, um, I had always been involved in athletics and sports and things like that. And then, you know, how many you know, as you get older and you get away from some things, and especially when you come into the ministry, you know, you know, you just kind of lose sight of exercising and, and, and eating right and stuff like that, you know. And, and then a lot of times, you know, if you're always in church services, you know, how I many you know after the church services you eat, you eat? <laughs> and you're not eating salad. <laughs> I mean, you eat fried chicken and collard greens and... You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, you, you understand what I'm saying? And so, and so, and it's nothing wrong with eating those things, but if you keep doing those things, you know, you, you can expect to gain some weight in some areas, you know? And so I know for me personally this year, uh, the Spirit of God said, you, well, you got to do this or else. And you hate for it to get to that point <laughs> when the Spirit of God speaks to you like that. And so I've been back in the gym, uh, you know, at least five days a week and, and things like that. And then, but what, but sometimes this year has been, that's been interrupted just a little bit, you know, because we've been traveling a little bit and things like that, but still been getting in at least two or three days of exercise if we're at the hotel, make sure I use the fitness center and stuff like that. So what I'm saying is those are some natural things that we need to do as believers, you know, uh, because sometimes we could be violating laws, natural law and spiritual law, and we don't know it. And, uh, but thank God, God is merciful. He's merciful. And, uh, but let's just go to the word for a few, for a few moments because that's the only thing that's going to put us over, right? Yeah. Is what the word of God has to say. Uh, Philippians 3, uh, verse 20. Uh, can you get my phone right there? Uh, I get it. I don't know what you get it. Hmm? Oh, um, also during this session, we would like for you, if you have a question or anything like that, to write it down or... Uh, you said what now? If you have a question and you like to write down a question on a piece of paper or something like that, uh, we'll just read it out and see if we can and see if we can get a, uh, get a, give you an answer by the Spirit of God. Now you don't have to write your name on it or anything like that, but uh, there's a bucket here, and and uh, if you have a question, we can just put it in that bucket and we can just see if we can get it answered. But I do want to bring up this verse. I believe I have it on my phone right here. Yep, sure do. Now, let's read Philippians 3.20 in the uh, King James. Now, I'm reading uh, the KG, KJVER. That's easy to read. And from what I understand, that's giving some people some... <laughs> They're like, what version? Did some, somebody came up... Well, I, like I was telling the, 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 the girl a few minutes ago is that they're out of print right now. But I love it because all they did was take out the these and the thous. We don't speak like that, you know? 
I mean, that's all they've done. So it's really an excellent version of the Bible. But I believe a company bought them out, and as soon as they bought them out, they stopped printing it because it was pretty popular. It was becoming popular, you know, but praise the Lord. Philippians 3.20, let's read this. It says, for our conversation is in heaven from where also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some of your footnotes in your Bible, that word conversation is the word citizenship. One translation says, we are citizens of heaven. And, you know, I'm a kingdom guy. Would you hear some more of that, about that tonight? You know, a lot of times in the body of Christ, we have these cliches. We'll, we'll have them on, you know, writings and say, I belong to the kingdom of God. And most believers don't even know what that really means. It's just, it's just a phrase we use. It's just something that, that we know we should say and talk about. But really, a lot of believers don't really understand what a kingdom really is. A kingdom is a form of government. You know, Isaiah 9, 6, I mean, you know that scripture, right? For unto us a child is born. And so but most of the time in the body of Christ, we concentrate on that scripture during Christmas time because it's on a bunch of Christmas cards. Right? But Jesus came to give us a government. What you and I belong to is not a religious institution. You know, and it's not denominational. You know, uh, the church is not even a religious organization. If I wish I could just have time to take you through that whole meaning of church, and, and I know many of you know it's the Greek word ekklesia, means called out ones, but if you really study it, it goes deeper than that. Because Jesus said, that when Peter got that revelation of who Jesus was, he said, upon this rock, the revelation of who I am, I'm going to build my church. The fact that he said my church tells us that there were other churches that existed. So the church was not, never a religious institution. Now, called out ones in, in um, Greek society, they would call out prominent people. You had to be 18 years of age. And they would call out prominent people from a public place and they would meet in an assembly. That's why the Bible considers the church the church assembly because they would assemble and what they would do is they would deliberate on what laws to enact in their society. That's what the exorcism was, that's what the purpose of it was. And once they came to an agreement on what laws they were gonna put into operation in that society, they approved them, and whoever was in those meet in that assembly, they were expected to go into their communities and, and, and enact those laws in their community. Where in our form of government, we would call that the Senate. You understand what I'm talking about here now? So that means we as Christian people, we've been having meetings here at this church all week, but really we've been having Senate meetings. We've been talking about spiritual laws. Things that God not only wants us to get a hold of, but he wants us to go and tell our neighbors, yeah. our bosses, our friends, people that live out in the world, and we're supposed to enforce those laws. That doesn't sound religious to me. Right? So, back on this word citizenship, did you know citizenship is not a religious word? Citizenship is a governmental term. It's, 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 it's a description that only applies to a group of people that are actually a part of a government. Now, it's, a, it's important that I said that because I'm gonna give you the definition of the root word of citizenship, which is citizen. And this is gonna mean something to you because of the name of this session is Freedom and Healing, and the name of this conference is a Freedom Conference. Did you know, did you, take, did you pay attention to the word freedom? It's a compound word. Free dominion. Free dominion or free to exercise dominion. Yes. And everybody is not free to exercise dominion. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when I did a study on this, now I've been teaching on the kingdom in my church. When I did a study, because I just, this past Sunday, well, not this Sunday, but the Sunday before, what is yeah, this past Sunday? I was teaching on citizenship. And during my study, I found out the sister word or the word that was related to citizenship is this word freedom, which means 
a person that can only be called a citizen, they had to be free. Meaning that a person, an individual, I'm talking about a human being, that exists, if he doesn't belong to a nation or a government, we call them slaves. Because a slave has no rights. He has no privileges. Therefore, he is, there are constraints put on him. There are restrictions put on him. He's not free to move around. He doesn't have freedom. This is, makes sense. You say, what does that do with healing? Just stay with me here because we, we're getting somewhere. Because we have to, if you would ask me, you, we all have our assignments in the body of Christ. If you would ask me why most of the body of Christ would struggle, I can easily tell you. Because I, I can't go into this, but I had experience with the Spirit of God in 2013, and he told me. He said, I ne this is what he said to me. He said, I never meant for any of my children to try to understand this outside of the kingdom concept. He said, to understand this, you got to put your kingdom goggles on. You have to filter everything I'm saying to you through this idea of kingdom. And when you do, you get this. Faith will come on the inside of you. Right? How I many, you know, you know, they brought this up, I don't know, one of the sessions. How I many, you know, one of the big things going on in our government, our natural government in the United States of America is that a problem with censorship. And so you got some, a lot of people say, well, you know, they're trying to take away our, uh, our First Amendment right, the freedom of speech, and, and that's not right. We should be free to say anything. Did you know your First Amendment right does not apply in the kingdom? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. Let me give you an example. We are not free or not made free to say whatever we want to say. Because the kingdom tells me what to say and what not to say. Therefore, I'm not just free to say whatever comes to my mind. Right. You see what I'm trying to understand? See, what we're trying to do is understand this book from the perspective of being an American, mm -hmm. Western society, instead of understanding it through Eastern culture, which they understood kingdom and honor and those concepts and things like that. But now I'm an American, I can do whatever I want to do. And you try to live that way according to the, what the word is. And so we're trying to mix two systems. Right? And you know, in the kingdom, we don't get a vote. <laughs> it's a theocracy. Whatever the king says, you do it or else. See, that's what happened to Adam. Adam didn't fall from heaven. Adam fell from citizenship. He fell from a nation. He fell from a country. He fell from a kingdom. And he lost his rights. And we know he lost his rights because he got kicked out of the garden. Now he's living like a slave. Now sickness and disease is attacking his body. Now he has to work by the spread of his brow. Now he has to sweat real hard just to make a nickel. Because he lost his citizenship. But let's translate it. He lost his rights and privileges that once belonged to him. But Jesus has restored all that. Jesus is, is more than God. He's more than Lord. He's more than Savior. He's the King. Yes. He's the King. Matter of fact, that's what he was on trial for in John chapter 18. They said, Pilate said, are you a king? He said, are you saying this by revelation or are you saying this because others told you this about me? See, we're going to have to tr trans, trans, we're gonna have to move from just what others have said to us getting a revelation ourselves on who Jesus really is. And so this word citizen, it means the free man of a city, state, or country that enjoys the rights, privileges, and benefits of the place that they reside in. Isn't that good? I'm gonna, I'm gonna repeat it again. The free man of a city, state, or country that enjoys the rights, privileges, and benefits of the place that they reside or live in. I'm gonna read it again. The free man of a city, state, or country that enjoys the rights, privileges, and benefits of the place that they reside in. 
there's so many benefits afforded us because of what Jesus did. But are we enjoying them? You know, I use this, you might want to do this as well. You know, I mean, the, the definition of words are always changing, especially in our, in our society, yeah, yeah, yeah. American culture. Yeah. I like to use on my phone is an app called Noah 1828. That's the original Webster's Dictionary. It gives the original meaning of words. Like, how many of you know this is a bad word, and I stopped using it a long time ago when this was brought to my attention, probably about six years ago. I don't use the word incredible. And so listen, I'm going to say it real slow and you understand why. Incredible. What you're saying is the story that you're telling is not credible. It shouldn't be believed. But in this society, we're taking a bad word and made it good. Let me tell you what happened in the meeting. It was incredible. Somebody got healed. What you just said is somebody got healed in the service I was in and don't believe a word I say. Wow. Huh? Words are powerful. Now let me give you the definition of the word freedom. I like this. Remember you can't be free or you don't have freedom if you don't belong to a country. You're a slave. The, the example of that is, is that slavery in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the United States, and it wasn't just black people, but a lot of people enslaved, that got taken from other parts of the world and brought over here, right? So whenever they took those people from their own country and brought them into a foreign land, it's obvious they had no rights. They had no rights. And that's why in that foreign land, once they got a, a hold of that no man should be enslaved, they petitioned the government of the foreign land they were in to give them rights. But what they were really asking for was the gift of citizenship. That's what they were asking for because they understood that if they were made a citizen by the government, then they can tap into the rights and privileges and the benefits that were conferred on its citizens, right? Therefore, they would be free. Free to what? Exercise dominion to tap in and to grab hold of the rights, privileges, and benefits that belong to them. So the word freedom means a state of exemption from the power or control of another. It means immunity from constraint or control. Let me say it again. A state of exemption from the power or control of another. It means immunity from constraint or control. So think about this. We just read here in the word, I'm going to read it again. For our citizenship is in heaven or from heaven from where also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what he's trying to get across to the Philippian church is, I know you're here on earth. I know earth has its own problems and issues, but I'm here to remind you, you don't draw your rights and privileges from your earthly citizenship. You need to learn how to draw and depend on your citizenship that's from another country that's called heaven. Hebrews 11 says heaven is a country. And so what he's trying to get across to these Philippians is, is that, look, you have rights and privileges available to you no matter what you're going through in the earth that, you, that, you, that you're in right now. Now, you know, ambassadors. How many know you know the Bible says we're ambassadors of Christ? See, that's not a religious term, is it? That's not a religious, that's a governmental term. Y'all know what the function of an ambassador is? He is sent from his government into a foreign territory to conduct business on behalf of the government he was sent by. And while he's there, they exercise diplomatic immunity. Which simply means that you don't live off the resources or no, let me say it this way. You don't depend on the resources of the nation or the country that we sent you to. 
You depend on the resources of the government that sent you. Matter of fact, if you have passports, it says that. It says if you get in trouble in the foreign, you demand you be taken to the United States Embassy. Why? Because you're not to be extradited by that government, you'd be extradited by your own government. So the thing about it is you and I, if we have been born again, now we understand what, why it's necessary to be born again. The word again means from above. Because Nicodemus asked him, he said, how can I get in on all these miracles? He says, simply you must be born again to enter the kingdom. See, Jesus was telling Nicodemus, the way you can get in on these miracles, these benefits, these rights and privileges, you have to be born. You have to free bo be free born. Yes. You have to be born into this nation to enjoy the benefits of this nation. Because he said, you come from God, which meant he knew this man wasn't from earth. Do you know you're not from earth? So many Christians, we think we're from earth. No, no, we're not. Not if you've been born again. You've been birthed by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And because of that, we are not citizens of this world. Now, I mean, I understand and the natural, you know, you're an American, I'm an American. And that's the thing, you know. People say this is a racist nation. No, it's not. You got racist people. They lack understanding. The nation's not racist. They just don't understand. You know, and there are times, so really the way I practice this, I have dual citizenship. You know, Paul practiced that. When I'm talking, you say I hadn't gotten to the healing part. I know I hadn't gotten to the healing part. We tagged him. But see, this has to be a foundation so we can understand what rightful belongs to us, where it's healing, whether it's finances, whether it's anything else. Right? So, Paul one time, uh, I believe it was somewhere around Acts chapter 20, uh, Paul one time got, he got, he got arrested. They arrested him. They didn't like what he was preaching. And they were getting ready to torture him and beat him. And he asked the guy that was getting ready to torture and beat him, he said, is it lawful for you to beat a Roman citizen? Yeah. Now, that's what the Bible says. He didn't get in that position and say, I'm a Christian. It's wrong for you to get, get ready to do this to me. I'm a Christian. See, Paul, he understood the kingdom of God. And he said, is it lawful for you to beat a Roman citizen? He said, oh. Up. You're a Roman citizen? And the Bible says the guy dropped his, his whip and he went to a superior and told him. And the Bible says his superior got a little nervous. Yeah. Yeah. And he came to him and he questioned him. He said, is it true that you're a Roman citizen? He said, because I'm a Roman citizen because I purchased mine with a large sum of money. But this is the what Paul said. He said, no, I was free born. Glory be to God. That's what he said. Go read it. I'm not making this up. He said, I was free born, which means my citizenship is greater than yours because I was born into the, yeah. to the Roman nation. Yeah. Wow. And the Bible says that man got afraid and he stopped torturing him. He apologized to him. And the Bible says he let him go what? Free. And Paul got upset. He said, oh, you're just going to let me free without saying anything? Without saying anything? He said, no. Nah. And he used his, his citizenship, his understanding of citizenship, went right back in the city and started preaching the gospel. I'm not, have you ever read this? Yep. You never thought that's what he was talking about, huh? <laughs> See, a lot of times we have to understand this. God will use us to the degree he can use this because he's always trying to get faith in the people. But just because someone, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't have the full understanding of things like we should. We only, not only do we all, we all know in part and see in part. But a lot of times what we've done, I know for myself, we, we, we think that that's all there is to it. Like Brother Hagen, I mean, I was very blessed when he wrote that book on Believers of the Heart. And thank God he did. Because if, if he didn't write that and didn't have that revelation, because Jesus appeared to him and gave him, gave him that book. So we're not, I'm not discrediting that, but I'm just saying there's some things Jesus or even the Holy Ghost can't talk to you about because he know you probably wouldn't want to grasp it. Yeah, yeah. And this is one of them I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. So when I had an experience with the Lord in 2013, I understood the believer's authority is really the citizen's authority. You see what I'm talking about here now? See, I understand why the believer has authority because citizenship has been conferred upon him. You know, the core scripture of our ministry is Romans 5, 17. 
It says those that receive an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign as kings in life, right? But notice what it says, gift of righteousness. It didn't say righteousness was the gift. See, that's all the body of Christ is. No, now righteousness is a gift. You need righteousness. But notice the word of is a preposition. Of means something that proceeds from something, which means that when God made us righteous, something came on us out of that righteousness is citizenship, which simply means I have put, 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 put in right standing, not only with God, but I'm in right standing with the government. As if I hadn't broken any laws. Now, citizens can have their rights and privileges suspended, right? Yes. <laughs> right? I'm free to drive a car, but within the confines of the law. Now, if I keep running red lights and violating driving under the influence, what are they going to do? They're going to put restrictions on me. They're going to take away my driver's license, right? But I'm still a citizen until I get that right. And that's what's happening in the body of Christ. We don't know it through ignorance. We're breaking laws in the kingdom and there are restrictions being put on us. And we don't wonder why we can't tap in and tap into this because our rights and privileges have been suspended because we're breaking the law. How many know this has been brought up in the conference? Don't sin. But we have turned the grace of God, I'm not talking about this church, I'm talking about the body of Christ have turned the grace of God and lasciviousness, meaning lasciviousness is me just living your life without constraint, which we understand as citizens, even in the natural, we're free to live only in the confines of the laws of our nation, which means I can't just go and mistreat my brother and sister and expect to be blessed. Even the Bible tells me about that, Right? That's a whole different message, but I'm just trying to get you to understand what I'm talking about when it comes to citizenship. You are free to receive everything that your government has provided for you. Why do you think in the natural, why do you think, it, you got a question? Why do you think in the natural that this government is trying to come up with a universal health plan? They have a financial sector. They have a transportation sector. They have a social sector. All these sectors that exist in these natural governments, the heavenly government has these sectors. They have an army, a military. We do too. It just consists of angels. We have a transportation sector. Ask Philip. He needed to get somewhere. And he was caught away in the spirit. We have a healing sector. There's healing power that flows from the government. We have a financial sector, and the, and the Bible instructs us how to tap into the financial sector by sowing seed. Yeah. That's right. the, 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 this is not, like one of my friends says, the kingdom of God is invisible, but it has predictable outcome, which means these operate by laws. I'm not, if I'm not ignorant of them, I can do it on purpose. I don't have to say, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. No, I know how it happened because I used the law. Now, Luke 5. Now, I said all that to say this. I'm going to give you some time, baby. No, nah, just mess with you. <laughs> she don't just mess with me. <laughs> but isn't that some good information? But that's just not information, this is revelation. Now, Luke chapter 5, let's look at verse 12. And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy. Now, this is Luke. Luke wasn't one of the 12 disciples. Matter of fact, Luke wasn't even originally picked by Jesus. I know a lot of Christians think that, but he was a Gentile writer. He's the only Gentile writer in the, in the four Gospels. And uh, he wrote his book much later, and he was a doctor. And not only did he write this book, but he wrote, also penned the whole book of Acts. And that's important to understand why the Spirit of God would not only pick a Gentile, but he picked a Gentile with his profession, he was a doctor. But yet there's no recorded instance throughout the Word of God where the Holy Ghost used this man's medical background to promote healing. And we need to take notice of that. 
Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to go to the doctor. I mean, I believe doctors are of God. And I, I just, I'm under the persuasion that anything that helps, use it. I mean, doctors are not a curse. I mean, sometimes you might need to put, perform some surgery on yourself. How many of you been working with a piece of wood and get a splinter in your hand? Yeah. Isn't that a surgery? You get some tweezers. Yeah. You get a needle and you open up your skin and you squeeze with those tweezers and pull it out. You just did a surgery. You were doctoring, you know. You <laughs> I mean, I know that might not be grammatically correct, but uh, you were practicing, you know, uh, you know, it, it's something in the med- they do in the medical field all day long. Now, you might not cut your chest open and, put, you know, <laughs> You know, it'd be cool if we can do that, save a bunch of money. I ain't close yourself back up. But anyway. <laughs> but the bottom line is, I wanted to bring out, the doctor said this man was full of leprosy. He just didn't have leprosy. He was full of this devilish disease. You ever seen leprosy on some people, pictures of it on the internet? I mean, this, I mean, skin just bunch of legions on it. I mean, some of them have missing body parts and because of the sores on the body, it's just oozing pus. I mean, you just look like somebody you don't even want to touch or even be around. So this man was full of leprosy. When he who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him saying, Lord, now this is the question. He asked him, if you will, you can make me clean. That's where a lot of believers are. They know God can. They know God is willing, but they're not too sure if it's his will for them personally. That's, that's the major hangup. It's easy for you to believe God can heal somebody but else, but when it comes to you, that's where you struggle. And I'm trying to tell you, the reason why you struggle by the Spirit of God is because you're not totally convinced that it rightfully belongs to you. That's where the struggle is. So notice he says, if you will, you can make me clean. And I always say this, let the Bible define itself. Let the Bible answer all of your questions. I don't care what you've experienced. I don't care if you what you've seen other people go through. Because when it comes to the healing, a lot of times... We'll try to base the results or a lack of results on somebody else's experience or what we've experienced. We say, well, so-and-so was believing God, they didn't get healed. So sometimes God heals and sometimes he doesn't. But you never read that in the book. So you're going to have to make a decision. I'm going to live by the book. I don't, I don't know what happened to them. I, and then some, but, but if you do investigate and investigation, you'll find out most of the time for believers, they just give up. Like, matter of fact, there was someone in our church. Uh, when did they go to be with the Lord? When did Brother David go be with the Lord? Probably about two years ago. And, uh, and I was really upset with this guy, man. I was so mad. I mean, I really was. I mean, this guy was awesome, man. I, I expected him. He, he was a true evangelist. I'm like, yeah, I got an evangelist in my church, you know? And next thing you know, he gets attacked in his body with cancer. And uh, he has to fight that thing. And sometimes you get attacked, right? Yeah. And so, may, I mean, he's just fighting and fighting and fighting. And one day I got a call from his wife. And she was upset, upset, upset about it because he had talked to her. And this is the exact words. He said, I know you believe in God for me to be healed. He said, I'm just tired. I'm tired of fighting. I'm just ready to go home and be with Jesus. And she was mad at him. But I want you to stay. He said, no, I'm tired. See, somebody on the outside that don't have that information will look at this perceived giant in the faith and say, well, he was believing God to be healed. Look what happened to him. He still died. But see, he don't have inside information. This man said out of his mouth that I'm tired I'm tired of fighting. Guess what? If you're tired of fighting, you're not going to fight. And that thing that's trying to take you out, you're going to let it. But thank God for heaven. I mean, that's not bad. I mean, you do get heaven. I mean, that's not a negative. Yeah. I mean, he, he got healed. I mean, but, but, but he, he just didn't want to spend out his days that he knew he had. Or he just got tired of fighting. And so we cannot base healing on someone else's experience. We have to base healing totally on what does the book say. I don't care about what so-and-so, and and then we're not with them 24-7. We don't know what they're actually saying out of their mouths. We don't actually know what's really in their heart. We don't actually know what they're actually thinking. 
We look on the outer appearance. God knows the heart. And so, but what I'm talking about for us individuals, we have to settle in our hearts and minds that no, healing belongs to me. And here this man wasn't sure if it was God's will to heal him, but he knew he could. And look what Jesus did. I love the actions of Jesus. And he put forth his hand. That's so beautiful to me. He didn't say, I will, and then touch him. He touched him first and then said, I am willing. Which means he demonstrated more of his will by his actions. Jesus is not about lip service. It says he put forth his hand and touched him saying, I will be you clean and immediately, not next week, but immediately the leprosy departed from him. Now, we, now the fact that that said immediately, I need to address this and I'm going to move on quickly. When it comes to divine healing, in the kingdom of God, there are two different processes. One here is immediate results, which is not always. But there's a primary way that healing always comes, and that's in Mark 16. He said, believers lay hands on the sick and they will recover, which means healing is either immediate or a process. But the moment the law of laying of hands applied, that moment you're getting better, no matter how you feel. That's right. You know, um, depending on, uh, you know how you, you, sometimes you go to the doctor and you might have some strep throat or something like that, and they give you antibiotics, right? And they'll tell you, they say, now take this for seven days. Now do not miss a day. And then they say, when you start to feel better, maybe that third day, don't stop taking them. You have to, you have to let it run. You have to keep taking them until that seventh day, right? Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. When they gave you antibiotics and the day you started taking them, what day did you start recovering? The day you started taking it. But did you feel like it? And you know that you started recovering the day you took it because after the seventh day, you're completely healed. You don't, you, don't, you don't get to the seventh day and then say, well, I'm healed. No, you started healing. The first day, you started applying that wisdom. So in the body of Christ, yes, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so, but you got to take, you got to continue and let let it run its course. And so, that's the way when it comes to the things of the spirit, you got to you got to reject any negative. You got to reject feelings. And said, no, hands were laid upon me. And the Bible says I be, when hands are laid upon anybody, I, I was a recipient and I, I began to recover. It's, it'd be good for you to write it, write stuff down and date it. And use that as a confession. Say, no, hands were laid on me on Monday to August the 13th at 8.30 at the church and, and I began to recover then and I'm recovering now. We have to maintain the confession of our faith without wavering. We cannot uproot what God began in us by our words. Now notice he says, and he charged him to tell no man, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer you uh, for your cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony to them. But notice this, verse 15, but so much the more went there a fame abroad of him and great multitudes came together, notice this, to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Now, this is a major spiritual law. If someone finds out, they go to the doctor and they find out they have stage three or stage four cancer, and immediately, I mean, a lot of times that, let's just be honest, a lot of times people are motivated by fear. But they at the same time know the solution, so they might run to their church or get on the phone and say, lay your hands on me, pray for me. I just went to the doctor, I found out I got cancer, you know? 
Well, you're going to have to then throw yourself in the whole bunch of hearing. Yeah. <laughs> hearing the right thing to get to that place of victory. Yeah. Why? Because you just heard. You just heard something that totally rocked you to your core. And so you're going to have to uproot the magnitude of that by continuing to hear what the Word of God has. I remember Dodie Osteen. I remember know Dodie Osteen, the wife of John Osteen. Many times people would come to her after she got healed and, and say, well, I've been doing what you did and I, and I hadn't gotten healed. What's my problem? She said, that's simple. You don't know enough. And what she meant was, you keep doing what you're doing until you hear. Because we live our life by what? Revelation. That's how, we access, that's how we access the kingdom. Look at Peter. When he heard who Jesus was, what did he give access to? The kingdom. So, now let's look at Matthew chapter 4 and then I'll be done. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. No, I won't be done, but I mean, then my part. But Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. <laughs> verse 23, now notice. So we can clearly see from God's word, it's his will. Now, if he can heal a man full of leprosy, and that was the most devilish disease of Jesus' day. Now, the most devilish disease of our day is that bad word, C word, cancer. More people get afraid of that than AIDS. Because now they got medication now. People can... People can take medication now to keep that thing at bay. But the one disease that seemed like they hadn't, this society hadn't been able to master is the C word, the cancer word. But Jesus mastered it. I mean, when he died for us, shed his blood, he purchased our healing in every area. Matter of fact, they talk about 39 stripes and they, from what they tell me, in the medical arena, there are only 39 different categories of disease. So that means the power of God can take care of any situation that works in the body. Oh, let me say this before I read this. So now, you're a citizen, right? But sent from another government to do business on the earth on behalf of heaven, right? You have to ask yourself, why healing? Why healing? Now, I mean, we, we've, we've said this. We've said this because God loves us. He wants to heal you. Now, that's true. But I'm just telling you, there's a greater truth than that. Time. See, that sounds, that sounds so simple. Well, what, what does that mean? It's just a provision built in the government. I'm talking about the heavenly government because my government knows it's sending me into a foreign land well, there's the, 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 the curse. And the curse will get on people's houses. Just like in the natural, your house decays and you'll want to paint it. You want to make repairs on it. Same thing with the body. So the, the why healing is so I can continue to do the will of God. Because if we're going to go, because why would he heal the body when you're going to die anyway? We never considered these things, huh? Why heal the body anyway? Because he's repairing the body to extend the time necessary to carry out the assignment. That's right. yes. See, if you know that, see, see, if you know that, you'll fight differently. Oh, wait a minute. I know the doctor told me he got cancer. I can see it on the screen, but I'm not moved by that. I believe a different report. I believe the report of the Lord. I'm going to go to church. Uh, matter of fact, he just said hands. He didn't say whose hands. I have hands. I'm going to lay hands on myself. You see what I'm saying? And I, and, I, and I say, I believe I'm healed. As a matter of fact, I cannot die. I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord because I know I'm not done. My assignment's not finished. See, that's a diff it's just a different understanding. Now, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it says, And Jesus went about a Galilee, teaching in their synagogue. Would anybody agree in the body of Christ? Now, I don't say body of Christ. I'm talking about even denominations, Catholics, and all that. Do they believe that the will of God is for us to have teaching. I've never met any person of any denomination argue against whether or not teaching was the will of God. What about preaching? He says he went around teaching and preaching. Would anybody agree with me that preaching 
is the will of God. See, have you ever heard a believer arguing, well, I don't know, I don't think he ought to be preaching. Now, I mean, we say that about people. You know, he might be need to sell some shoes or something. But, but, I'm just talking, but I'm talking about in the context of, has anybody walked out of me talking about, I just don't believe the will of God for preaching to ever take place. <laughs> All these people going around thinking preaching is the will of God. And teaching. Well, everybody's preaching and teaching something, whether you're standing behind one of these or not. Right, but, but I'm just saying, wouldn't that be comical in that sense that if you heard any believer, Christian for any denomination, arguing with somebody, talking about, I just don't believe the will of God is for any preaching to ever take place. Isn't that crazy? Why anybody ever preaching? That sounds kind of dumb, doesn't it? But let's keep reading, though. We wouldn't consider that. The gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness, all manner of disease among the people. Now, have you heard someone say that healing is not the will of God? Did you see what they just did? They took one thing out of the context of the scriptures and made that not part of the will of God when the other things connected to it, the teaching and preaching, is, they say is the will of God. So if teaching and preaching is the will of God, that means healing has to also be the will of God. Remember what the remember what words are important? Will simply means now, uh, this dear sister in the back here, say, you know, she has a friend or a loved one and this person has been so good to her or she just, and just this person's just in her heart. And so she draws up a will on what she wills for that person to have, right? Now, the only way that can be contested, and a will is only good when that person that drew it up, when they die. But the only way that can be contested is if uh, she didn't make it legal and put it in the right hand so that person can know about and they'd have to go through the law, the, the, the proper authority to administrate that will, right? But now, when it's just written down and everybody sees it, listen to what I'm saying. Once that will that she drew up is written down and everybody sees it, no one can refute. That's not what she intended because she's the one who came up with the will. What am I saying? Who am I to say healing is not the will of God when I'm not the one to control and wrote the will in the first place? I didn't write it. This is his will and testament. He, intend, he told me healing all manner of sickness, all manner of disease. So how can I say it's not his will? I said he was lying when he wrote it. You see what Christians are doing? That's, that's crazy, isn't it? He told, plainly told us what his will is. He's the one that wrote it, and I, either I get in agreement with it or I don't. You might as well be better off and say, he did will it, I just don't believe it. That, I, I can accept that. But don't try to push that off on someone else and say it's not the will. You just simply hadn't gotten to the place where you believe it for yourself. Then in verse 24 it says, and his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought to him some sick people. No, it said all. Which means it doesn't matter what disease or what sickness you had, you can come to Jesus. Brought to him all sick people that were taken with divers or different diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those that were lunatic. Now, some of your footballers say crazy, but I studied this out. It says people with mental issues. The biggest issue today is mental disease. So people with mental problems got healed in Jesus' ministry and they didn't have to take medication for it either. And because a real doctor tell you they can't treat mental disease. Your soul is spiritual just as much as your spirit. Now, your body is just purely physical. Now, he says, possessed with devil, those who were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he did what? Them. He healed them all. And I'm going to stop there. And I'm going to let Tadasi come on up. Wow, that was good. There is no doubt 
on what the will of God is concerning healing and our citizenship. Amen. So praise the Lord. Thank you for letting me talk, Pastor Jay. <laughs> That's funny. Hallelujah. Well, some of this is going to overlap, of course, but uh, I couldn't have laid it out the way the Holy Ghost had him laid it out for sure. You could see it line upon line, precept upon precept, that that is the will of God, that it is our citizen right, that we be healed and walk in divine health, and he gave us the why so we can continue to be effective in building the kingdom and fulfilling our purpose. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to talk to, uh, today about healing for the whole man. All right. Um, so we know we are spirit, right? We have a soul and we live in a body. All right. And we have to first believe that God is and that he's good. And we have to be fully persuaded of healing being for us. And Pastor Jay has already covered that. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, and I, but I wanted to go to Galatians 5, 6. And it says here, in part of this verse, it says, faith worketh by love. Faith worketh by love. Now, we know that when we live as kingdom citizens, that faith pleases God, and faith is um, the currency that we use in the kingdom of God for transactions, to bring, to, to bring heavenly things into manifestation here in the earth. We do it by faith. And we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, meaning we're hearing it over and over again. All right. But I want to say something. So faith right here, it says, but faith, it says you're when it's talking about faith, it means that we're persuaded, that we're fully confident. OK, so by our full persuasion of uh, faith worketh or faith is energized or faith is increased by love. And when I'm talking about love, if you look this word up, love is a revelation of his love. Okay, agape love, divine love, what God prefers. So in order for us to receive from God, in order for our faith to work, we have to be fully persuaded and fully confident that we serve a God that is a good God and that is a God that loves us. And when we are fully persuaded that God loves us, then we won't doubt in our hearts that he'll want to go the extra mile, that he wants to heal our bodies, that he wants to restore our families, that he wants to restore our finances or do anything that is good on our behalf. So we have to be fully persuaded, fully confident in this love that he has for us. The next thing I want to talk about is God understands that we are three-part makeup. Okay, he understands that because he's the one that wrote the manual, <laughs> All right? So he has included with this product that he's made, he has included a maintenance plan and care instructions. Anytime you buy something, it comes with care instructions and a maintenance plan. We just got a new iron that's fancy and my husband had to go over the care instructions with the kids <laughs> so they don't break the iron, <laughs> okay? We got posted care instructions on by the washer and dryer because we got multiple users, right? All right, so think about it. God created you. Every cell, every organ, every tissue, right? And he has given us a care, care instructions. He's given us something to work with so that we can have what? Optimal performance, optimal performance. Because if you don't take care of that thing right, if you don't use the right products, you can mess it up. And how many of us have done that? We've just wrecked ourselves. One of the things that God recently revealed to me is that one of the things that caused me to have some challenges in my own health was that I broke the law concerning rest. I was having a conversation with my husband. We were on a, a mini vacation for our um, 23rd wedding anniversary, and we were just having a conversation. We're always talking about spiritual things. Good to be equally yoked, y'all, just saying. And, uh, and so we're talking about, uh, you know, these things, and he starts talking about in Genesis and, you know, and talking about how the earth rested and it needed to rest, and on the seventh day God rested. And in that conversation, the light bulb went off, and I said, oh, man. I said, that's why I've been having these challenges in my body. I've been going and going and going and going and not do, I, I don't stop to rest. I'll give you a little bit of history. I work a full-time job outside of ministry. I have four kids and, and I have lots of hats in ministry. So I didn't get a day off. And so I would work Monday through Friday at my job 
And then on Saturday, I would prepare things. I mean, I'm preparing. You should always prepare your vessel and spend time with the Lord. But on Fridays, we know we, uh, Saturdays, we'd have preparation for ministry things on Sundays. And then we'd have practice during the week. And then things had to be done at home. And so I was like, Lord, when would I take a day? But as soon as I heard, this is so good, as soon as I got the light that I had, had a, made a misstep, because I didn't do it intentionally, I made a misstep, a sin. I was like, oh, God. I immediately repented. I didn't beat myself up about it. I immediately repented and I said, oh God. And I fixed it right then. I said, okay, God, what day do I need to take? What day is going to be my day off? And I went through the whole thing I just did with you. And I said, well, you know, I can't do it this day, this day, this day. And so I just had to rearrange my schedule. And so Saturdays are going to be my days when I go back to school. Now I'm off right now from the other job so I can, you know, mix a day here and there. But when I start back to work, Saturday's going to be my day. But I need that for my mental and my physical. I need a day and, and, and to just do nothing or do what I want to do. There's something very powerful in that. And God wrote it in the script and I didn't recognize it and I ignored it and it caused me to have some physical challenges in my body. So now, guess what? I'm on my way to recovery. I'm recovering. All right. So divine health, uh, so in the kingdom, in God's kingdom, divine health is deposited and maintained in the spirit of a man. Okay, so we're talking about the kingdom. Your spirit, everything works in the kingdom from the inside out. All right? Um, So you were born again, and when you became born into the kingdom, you received God's divine nature on the inside of you. Heaven was deposited. All right. Everybody was given a measure of faith. He said, I'm going to give you something to work with. You're in the kingdom. You need some currency in God. Good. You come to the kingdom, come to this country. He give you some currency to work with. (laughs) He didn't leave you empty handed. Right. So he gives you some currency and that's on the inside of you. Now, the Bible says that we are ground and in order to have fruit, we must plant seed in the ground. I'm, I'm jumping right there. So I'm going to Matthew 13. Let's look there. Matthew 13. Um, And we're going to look at verse 3, but we're not going to read that all. You can go back and read it. And basically, it's the parable of the sower. All right, I'm there. All right, so if you go there, you read the parable of the sower. If you jump down to verse 19, he explains it, and that's where I want to go. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. Now he's talking about in the parable originally, he's talking about seed, a farmer sowing seed. Well, guess what? He just says the seed is what? The word. And he said, you have to do what? You have to sow that word into your heart. Now, um, Uh, Brother Eddie did a great job last night talking about what that looks like, talking about walking by faith, talking about getting your words in the right place, talking about meditating on the word. Because when you meditate on the word, he said, he goes, I get on people's nerves because I'm walking around talking the word all the time. What is he doing? He is planting that in his heart. And so that's what we have to do when it comes to healing, when it comes to health, when it comes to anything in the kingdom where we're lacking. we got to find what it says in his will and know what his will and testament is. And we're talking about healing, so we have to know. Pastor Gerald just laid it out. Okay, I know it's God's will. I know not only is it his will, it's my right because I'm a citizen and I have a work to do. And he would be unfaithful if he didn't um, not only call me, but equip me and give me the tools that I need to finish the job that he's given me. And then guess what? When you get a job, don't you get a benefits plan? All right, this is our health benefits plan. And sometimes you have to go to the doctor, right? So we have to go to Dr. Jesus sometimes and say, okay, I need hands laid on me. That's why the provision is there. So don't get in condemnation and say after years of me doing this or doing that, that, you know, I don't deserve it. I earned this cancer. I earned this because I smoked 20,000 packs of cigarettes or whatever. No, you stepped into a new kingdom, kingdom citizenship. And guess what? All that's been made available. All your sins have been forgiven. If you picked up a cigarette, just say, God, forgive me. I repent. Help me not to want it anymore. I don't desire it. I'm delivered. I'm set free. And begin to walk in that. Get your mouth moving in the right direction. But the Bible says here in Matthew 13, he's talking about we're ground. 
we're ground. And remember, I just made the reference that I found out my ground needed to rest. So not only does my ground need to rest, my ground needs some seed put in it so I can see some fruit in my life. That's why we tell people when you get born again, when you become part of the kingdom, you don't know anything about the kingdom. You don't know anything about this government that you've just become a part of. If I moved to China, I don't know anything about China. I could do some research, but it's nothing like when you get there and you start walking it out. You need somebody to teach you. You need somebody to show you. You got to learn the language. You got to learn the culture. And that's why you got to be a part of the right assembly. So you can learn the culture of heaven and begin to live like heaven on earth. Because you've been in this other system so long, you don't know any different. And how dare you walk into a house of God and say that's not right when you don't even know what kingdom is. You've been to heaven before? You know what all's there? <laughs> just asking. But the Bible says we're ground, and in order to have fruit, we must plant seed in the ground. We have to plant that seed in our spirit. So that's one way that we lay hold of healing in our lives, by planting that word in our spirit. And we guess what? We have to keep hearing and hearing and hearing. And so when I've had things attack my body, one thing I've done that Brother Eddie was talking about is I wake up. I remember one time I woke up and there was a fever trying to attack my body. I said, well, well, people go to work. I'm not receiving this. So I went to work, taking no off day, sick day. Well, people go to work, <laughs> right? Um, not only that, and then, you know, you get to, you, Brother, brother um, Kenneth Hagen has a bunch of healing uh, CDs on YouTube. <laughs> Pull those out. You know, start listening to ministers teach on healing. You know, faith ministers, Brother Copeland, Brother Hagen, Pastor Eddie, Pastor Joe. Find somebody that's full of faith where you can hear that over and over and over again. Because to be honest with you, if you're dealing with it, that's just an area that you're weak. And if you can recognize where you are, then you can plan on how you're going to get to where you want to go. So just because you're sick in your, your body or a, a sickness that is attacking your body doesn't mean necessarily that you've even done anything wrong. You live in a fallen realm and you have a real enemy out there and he wants to take you out. So just because you got shot doesn't mean you deserved it. Now, sometimes you have to ask yourself, how did I get in this situation? But if the Holy Spirit doesn't reveal, the spirit of the living God doesn't reveal anything to you, then guess what? There was nothing there. He loves you, so don't walk around saying, well, man, I must have done something. It must have been a sin that I didn't know about. No, Holy Spirit, God loves us, and if there's something we need to know and we are seeking and we are asking, he is going to reveal it to us. And if he doesn't reveal anything to you, then there's nothing there. It's just an attack of the enemy. Amen? All right, so here's the bottom line so far. You must sow and plant God's word in your spirit by speaking and meditating on that word. I know that's so hard, so difficult. <laughs> it's just so simple, we miss it. And if you're doing that, continue to do it. And because what you're doing is you are watering and you are fertilizing. Guess what, you wanna see a plant grow? Does it grow overnight? No, you keep watering it, you keep tending to it. So you keep tending to it with the word and you'll see the manifestation of it, amen? All right. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Here we go. 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 1. Simon Peter... Um, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith, that's us, <laughs> with us through the righteousness of God. See, when we came into the kingdom, he made us right, right? Jesus did all, he paid all the price for our sin. So we're right with God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse two, grace and peace be multiplied to you. How? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord through the knowledge. So when you came here this morning, you needed to know some more when it came to your healing. 
because maybe you've been battling or you know somebody else has been battling and you're wondering, what's this delay? There must be something I don't know, something else that I need to know and you're seeking. But he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of, our G- of Jesus, our Lord. So we just got to continue to seek his will and his knowledge concerning the matter. The more we know, people say, what you don't know can hurt you, can't hurt you. Not true. What you don't know can't hurt you. <laughs> All right. Um, Let's see here. I want to keep going. Verse 3. Now, I'm going to touch on this later, but notice in verse 2 before we move on, grace and peace. Grace and peace. Oh, I can't go there yet. Okay, okay. Verse 3. According to as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We've been given all things. His divine power Wow, that's on the inside of us. Through what? The knowledge of him. So it's kind of like what Sister Jody said. You just don't know enough yet. Keep looking, keep seeking, keep knocking. All right, keep asking. That has called us to glory and virtue. Now, verse four. Now, I want to say something about verse three. His divine um, power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Has given, meaning we already have it. This life and godliness is accessible through the knowledge of him. So we have access to everything in the kingdom through the knowledge of him, through this word. So he's like, look, this is your manual, and this is how you gain access. There are different tools that he's laid out in this manual, okay? So we're talking about healing. Let's keep going. Let's go to verse 4. I'm going somewhere. Whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, I forgot to mention this. Um, We talked about, let me rehash. uh, We must be fully persuaded of who we belong to and what's ours. Brother Gerald, uh, Pastor Gerald did a great job helping us with that. The Bible is our source for health care and maintenance, right? We just talked about that. But what about the promises? That's what I was at. What about the promises? Because we, people say, well, how do I know that they're promises? And what I'm saying here is, gather my thoughts, his divine power has been, has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And then verse four, through the knowledge of him, we are given precious promises. So in this word, God has tucked away promises, commitments, benefits. We just have to find them. And when we find them, we can deposit them. And when we deposit them, we can gain access. Does that make sense? All right, through the knowledge of him, you are given precious promises by laying hold aggressively or by grabbing hold, okay? That's what Brother Eddie was talking about yesterday evening. You got to lay hold. You got to be aggressive with this thing. You can't be passive because the enemy who's attacking you and your family and trying to take you out, he's not just trying to take you out. He's trying to take out your children, your children's children, and anything that has any replication of Jesus or family and what you've been fighting for, and you're going to have to fight back. And you're going to have to say no more. I will not allow sickness and disease to live in any cell in my body, in any tissue in my body, in any organ. I made a decision. I said, cancer can't live in my body. Cancer can't stand it. It is not the right environment for cancer, not this body. But let me tell you how skillful the enemy is. So I go to the dentist, right? And I go to the dentist and they do preliminaries and I look at this paperwork and they say, well, and it says cancer screener. I was like, well, why is that there? Oh, it's just part of what we do as our, you know, preliminary. I said, I don't need that. Well, you know, I can let you talk to the dentist. I said, I don't need to talk to the dentist. I don't need that. Why, if I have been confessing that cancer can't live in my body, that it's the wrong environment, why would I open the door for the enemy to do a test for cancer. That's a door. I said, I'm leaving that door shut. That doctor didn't come talk to me because that was not an open door. See how he is? He'll try to get an open door. You think, well, it's just preliminary. Everybody does it. Nope, I don't do it because I know what I've been saying and I know what God says when it comes to me 
and my health. Amen? All right. Um, where was I? Here we go. So you have to be aggressive. You have to lay hold of what these promises are. You have to be aware of them um, to partake of the divine nature and to escape the world's corruption. Let me say that again. Through the knowledge of him, God has given us precious promises that we have to aggressively lay hold to to partake of that divine nature that's already been deposited to see the manifestation of it, to see the fruit, and also to escape the world's corruption. We have to lay hold. So God's already done his part, and now we have to do our part. Amen? And I talked about how to lay hold. We plant that word in our, we find out what his will is. When we find out what his will is, we continue the law of confession and meditation, get it in our hearts, plant it in our spirits, okay, so we can see a harvest. And as we're saying it and we're hearing it, guess what? Faith comes by hearing. Our faith is increased. Our faith is built up, right, when that happens. And so that's the deposit that we need to make when it comes to healing. Um, so what's God's will? What's his end game? Now, this is the part I want to get to. Let's go to Romans 2.11. I want to show you some things first. I think Brother Tracy said it one time. I think I'm pulling up to the driveway or on the street or something like that. I'm getting ready to close. <laughs> I love the way he said it. It was so funny. All right. I said Romans 2.11, and y'all already there. For what? There is no respect of persons with God. So it's not something that God will do for somebody else that he's not going to do for you. I know people say, oh, I'm God's favorite. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure you are. He doesn't have favorites. He does operate differently and communicate differently according to our personalities. Because for each person, he's a personal God. Okay, but he's not a respecter of persons. So he's not going to give something to you and make it available to you and not make it available to you, except that maybe you're not reached that level of maturity yet. Think about it. You have kids in your home at different ages that can access different things, not because they're favorites, but because of their level of maturity. So it's the same thing in the body of Christ. You'll have access to things as you begin to mature and grow in the word. The more you spend time with him in the word, the more your access you'll have because you'll have more information. And if you prove yourself faithful, then he can see that you can handle it and you can carry it. All right. So I want to point out here that God's no respecter of persons. So it's not a, his will to heal you and it's not his will to heal you. That's his will for everybody. Those in the kingdom and those out of the kingdom. He wants freedom for all. That's what he paid for. All right, he paid the entire price. Bill's paid. All right, let's go to Jeremiah 29, 11. Very popular scripture, but I want to read it. Remember, he's not a respecter of persons, right? He says this. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of what? Peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. It's for everybody. He meant it here, and he means it for you and for me. That's why he wrote it down, because he knew we'd see it, and he knew we'd want that, and so he made it available to us. He says, yeah, he's got a plan for you. I've got good plans for you. I've got good plans for you, and, I gotta, and your end is not a tragic end like in a movie. It's a glorious end, all right? Victorious win. All right, fight of faith means you're going to win in the end, right? All right, it's going to end up in your favor. Now let's go to 3 John 2. In 3 John 2, he says, another popular scripture, beloved. Anybody in here his Beloved. Yes, yeah, see, she's convinced. Beloved, I wish above all things, how many things? All things that you may what? Prosper. Now, we all in here, if you're at a conference like this, you know that prosperity goes way beyond any counting money, right? I tell people I'm living my best life now. I got a great life, 
I got an awesome husband. My kids are great. I like them. I like my husband. I got a nice house. I mean, it's, and it's not as big as I mean, but there's just so much to be thankful for. So much. You know what I mean? I got good health. I got, I got a good health plan. You just, I'm telling you about it. I mean, come on, you can't lose. You can't lose. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be what? In health. But here's my key. This is where I wanted to go. Even as your soul prospers, that's where your prosperity is maintained in here. You're thinking about, um, you're thinking about God and who he is will affect your health. He just said, if you just believe that Jesus came to teach and preach, but healing is not for today, you don't have access to that. If you don't think God loves you enough or cares enough about you to be concerned about the situation because he's too busy taking care of all the other parts of the world and things in the world. How you think people think that. Um, what you think about God and how you perceive him will affect every aspect of your life. Okay? Think about the people that when Jesus went to minister to them in his hometown, they thought him as common. And they didn't receive him as the true gift that he was. So he couldn't do what God's will was because they were not able to receive so we have to see God properly. We have to see him as our source. Whenever things do attack us, we have to go to him first because he's our source. We don't seek the doctor first. We seek him first and we ask him if that's something we should do. And then if he gives us, a, and then he, we wait for his instructions on what to do. And if he says, okay, go to the doctor, then we do that. But we always seek him first. We seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and the things that we're desiring will be added to us. Okay? Um, so what you think matters, what you think about who God is and how he perceives you, what you think about yourself matters. This is all, this is all tied in to your health. Okay? Thinking whether you're worthy or unworthy whether you're qualified or unqualified, whether you're good enough or not good enough, whether your past mistakes have hindered you, um, whether you're deserving or undeserving because maybe you were a bad mom or a bad dad or you did this or you did that, or whether you see yourself as righteous or unrighteous. All of this is tied to your health, your mental health, your physical health, your spiritual health. So the key to prosperity in your health or in finance or anything else is in your thinking. So what we really are talking about today, when we talk about health, freedom, we're talking about getting our minds and our spirits, aligning ourselves with our kingdom our king, and the way he thinks, and the way he operates. And when we align ourselves, we have access to the benefits that have already been made available. Right now in the natural, if you were to get sick, most people that don't have any spiritual input, what do they do? They go to the doctor. They listen to the doctor, give them instructions and things like that. Okay, but in the kingdom of God, we go to what? We go to the word. We go to the king, and we see what the king has to say about our situation. But it's going to require us to get in a place of hearing where we're not sinning on purpose. We're going to break away from some things. And not only that, get in a place where we actually look at this manual, seek what's in it, now you can Google stuff. Still look it up in your Bible, though. All right? And <laughs> make sure it's accurate. All right? Um, but let me pick up my thought. Look at this manual, but get in a place where you can hear God speak to you concerning your life. And when you take the time to get in that quiet place 
and put him first. Put him on the pedestal that he belongs on. And seek him first. Then what you've been looking for in all the wrong places you will find, including your health. And it starts with your mental health. Okay. And it's available to every citizen. Amen. Proverbs 23, 7 says this. And this is actually a scripture that is used a lot, but in the, it's used in the context of a person that's being cheap. <laughs> They're saying, oh yeah, help yourself, you know, but in their hearts is something different. And it says, for as he thinketh, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And then it goes on to to refer to the context, eat and drink, saith he that to thee, but his heart is not with thee. Why did I bring this scripture up in the context of health? Because a lot of times we are saying something with our mouths concerning where we are spiritually, what we're believing God for, or our situation, and we're saying the right things, but it's really not in our heart. And the evidence that you're not fully persuaded or that it's not really in your heart, is the fruit that you bear. So, with that being said, I'm going to go back to 3 John. Beloved, this is God's will. I wish, above all things, that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Amen? Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. Now, uh, I know we're right at 12 o'clock, um, but I know um, you came to this uh, session. Obviously, either you wanted to hear more about what the Spirit of God wanted to say on this subject, or maybe there's something, a uh, physical challenge that you may have in your body or you may know a loved one that's having a physical challenge or something like that. We don't want to leave out of this session without praying because it would be wrong for us to, you know, teach this information and not give an opportunity to act on what we just heard. Can I say something on yes. that? So when we say pray, I want you to think when we say pray, I want you to think we're petitioning God. Yeah. We're taking this upstairs. Well, he's not upstairs, but you know what I mean. Okay? <laughs> we're taking it to the king. And we're family. And there's nothing wrong with asking family to get in agreement and say, fight this with me. Yes. For us to gird each other up. So I don't want there to be any condemnation when you're in a place that you need to ask somebody, I need your help, my brother. I need your help, my sister. I need you to stand with me. I need to be encouraged. Amen. Yes. So is anyone in a room like that this, uh, this afternoon? You want us to get in agreement with you and pray with you? Well, praise the Lord. We'll just come on up here and we'll just pray with you. Stand in agreement. Is that all right, Pastor Trump? Yeah.